Hey everybody, it's Evan Palmer, and I'm here today with Matt Jaffe, Mill Valley native, and we're here at the, the Depot Bookstore, downtown Mill Valley. Matt, I've been so dying to talk to you. We met a couple of years ago at a charity event. Yeah. And I don't know if you remember, I remember really well. As soon as I saw you, I ran over to you and I said, okay, you gotta tell me, how did it happen? <laughs> but before you do that, let me just set it up because there's a lot of people that don't know your story, which is remarkable, but you're a singer-songwriter and you started playing guitar, writing music in what, high school? Uh, before, I uh, started as a classical violinist playing various concertos, which I'm glad I have that background, but yeah. I was frequently trying to procrastinate from practicing by uh, playing a little nylon string guitar we had at home. And uh, How was the action on that? I have no idea. <laughs> I, when your first Because I had one and the, the strings were like a yeah. half inch off the neck. Sure. <laughs> well, when you play your first guitar, you have no idea that you can change it even. You just think, right. this is what guitar feels like. Exactly. Um, yeah, so when I was about nine or ten, I I started leaving violin behind, much to the chagrin of my mom. And uh, yeah, around ten, I started playing open mics up in Fairfax. No and, kidding. Uh, yeah. So one day you go to an open mic, and you know this is what we're all taught. You know, all of us want to be musicians. Myself. I'm talking about myself a lot here. You know, it's like, oh, you just write a song and you go to an open mic and then, you know, good things are going to happen. So one day you go to an open mic, and which generally means that you get to play, what, like two or three songs yeah. maybe, and then somebody else comes up. and So you probably picked out a few songs to play, which were your favorites at the time maybe. Ah, uh, yeah. You're, I, I, I'm a sucker for playing whatever's newest, so cool. possibly just the newest, yeah. And you go there, did you have any kind of thought about, oh, well, something could, there could be some shift to my trajectory because of this one night? Uh, certainly not that particular night. I, I tried to play two or three open nights every week. Okay. If I, if I finished homework, my folks would always take me to an open mic, so I always did homework really quickly. Kudos and, uh, to your parents. Oh, yeah. They've been, they are... I would not be where I am today without them. No doubt about that. Uh, but one night, one open mic was different from all the others. Tell me about it. Well, uh, at an open mic at the, uh, the Sweetwater Music Hall here in Mill Valley. I, at the time, it was actually still the Masonic Hall. Okay. It had yet to transform into Sweetwater 2.0. Um, one of my heroes, Jerry Harrison of Talking Heads, was there and, uh, <laughs> and offered to produce a record for me. Did he, was it like afterwards that he like, well, came over and... So it's a slightly longer story that begins a few years earlier, actually. Um, in fifth grade, I was doing a project on Talking Heads, a school project on Talking Heads. In fifth grade? Yeah. Nice. And, uh, <laughs> and I, I saw him at a restaurant here in Mill Valley, learned that he lived in town, and, uh, and I sent him a message, a, a letter, you know, once people still did snail mail, I, I sent him a letter asking if I could interview him for this project. No kidding. And I never heard back from him. But then one day, uh, my dad was driving me back from a piano lesson, and we saw him in the car next to us. So, we followed him, and he parked at a hardware store um, here in town, and uh, we got out and said, hey, I sent you a letter. Can I interview, interview you for this? And he kind of was like, oh, yeah, yeah, I got that letter. And, and he let me interview him. He was very gracious, very encouraging, and uh, and we struck up a kind of friendship, whatever kind of friendship can be had between a what a, a twelve year old and a, a rock and roll hall of famer. Right. Um, and uh, so I didn't know he was at that particular open mic, but we did have a history, uh -huh. and I think that history um, provided a necessary framework for what transpired thereafter. And he obviously heard something in your songwriting <laughs> and your performance that he wanted to help you get to the next level. Yeah, he, uh, he, he paired me with some fantastic studio uh, musicians and uh, 
helped motivate me to form my own band, and most importantly, I think, just gave me the confidence and proactive energy to just decide to go after this livelihood. Um, I think it was always uh, an important passion for me doing these shows and, uh, and open mics, but I think it took that, uh, that faith from someone who I really admired to sort of take me into the next gear. Right, right. So here you are. Now you've, you've toured with some big names already, and you're still such a young guy. you got so much in front of you. Yeah. And so, so and you're doing something that's, that's really interesting. You're, not only are you the musician that provides music for when, when we go out and we want to be entertained and we, we want to hear something new, but you're also becoming the artist, the person that, oh, I want to hear what Matt just wrote. Uh, I want to hear something new, something fresh. And you're kind of walking in both worlds. What does that feel like to, to be not only the musician entertainer, but also the, the artist that is also creating? Sure. Um, I, think it, I think it takes perspective and uh, acknowledgement of, of what you're going into. I've played lots and lots of gigs over the past 10 or so years. Everything from retirement homes and juvenile halls uh, with bread and roses um, to playing these farmers markets where certain produce vendors will gift you produce as long as you'll turn down <laughs> your PA uh, to, get, to get into open for, uh, you know, Wilco and Los Lobos up on Mount Tam and Blues Traveler at the Fillmore and around the country. Gosh. And what a mix. Yeah, it's, <laughs> well, it can be a little bit of whiplash, really. Yeah. Um, and it can be tough uh, trying to trying to grow a career as a songwriter, someone who who's playing shows where people care about a statement versus um, versus these more sort of background music gigs, where music is also a really important factor. Absolutely. But whether I'm playing my songs or uh, Bob Dylan, Hank Williams covers, Hank Williams covers, uh, it's sort of immaterial. Yeah. Um, in fact, if you whip out Mary Jane's Last Dance, people tend to really love that. <laughs> and then maybe they'll pay attention for another song if it's yours, but then they'll go back to their cocktails. Which, as a singer-songwriter, can be a little discouraging, but that's why you have to take ownership of the context. Right. Um, and, uh... Like that's really good advice right there. Yeah, I, I think right now I'm at a little bit of a crossroads. Um, trying to figure out how to how to sort of grow into being an artist more. I, I've the last two or so years I think I've taken big strides in learning how to be a working musician in this area. Um, which which is a, a job I love doing. And yet um, I could probably be playing seven nights a week, playing different venues and not necessarily be taking steps towards being a touring artist, someone who puts okay. out records that are really uh, appreciated. Um, I, it definitely doesn't hurt that cause, but uh, learning how to take sort of steps as an artist aren't necessarily um, abetted by doing every possible gig, even if it pays a couple hundred bucks or something. Right. Uh, and how much more complicated does it get now that we have social media and all of this access to musicians, which of course on one hand is awesome, we've never had that before, and, and for us to get to know the people that we really enjoy hearing and finding out their stories is fantastic, but on the flip side, uh, you lose a certain amount of privacy that way too, you know, how do you balance that? What's, yeah. what do you, how, do you, how do you deal with that? Well. I think the, for me, I think I just tried to embrace it, actually, because I think um, as a kid growing up in the sort of like, I think I'm somewhere between Gen X and Millennials, like, I, I think I have sort of towing that line. Okay. 
I think millennials like love social media, whereas Gen Xers sort of also kind of love it, but they pretend to be too cool for it. Um, so I'm, I'm sort of, I know all these friends in high school and college who have gotten off of Facebook and are like, oh yeah, I don't even use my Instagram, I just have it. Um, and, and for me it's like, well, I, I understand that, uh, that cynicism toward it. it. It does sort of, um, Abstract like these real life experiences that we long for, but for me, as a someone who's trying to develop a career that centers on that connectivity to fans, it would just be sort of self defeating to really um, to try to destroy my own presence. I think that uh, I think that for me, I consider it part of my work, yep. and I embrace it for that reason, and just try to find. The, the balance that I try to find is the proper amount of myself to turn over to the internet uh, while still still making the music the nucleus of it, yeah. not where I am eating brunch that day. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. And speaking of music, you've got uh, a release last year, Spirit Catches You. Yeah. How's that doing? Uh, it's it's doing well. Um, I'm I'm really proud of it. I, uh, the guy who produced it, his name is James DePredo. I couldn't be more thankful for the, the work he did on it. Um, it's the first album I've done where I just am sort of unabashed <laughs> in, in wanting people to listen to it because I'm really proud of the the sound quality and the pretty much everything. Oh, uh, it's got to feel uh, good. Yeah, yeah, it does. I think it's. Uh, I think it's gotten a good response. Um, we've done a couple of videos off of it that have helped, helped move the needle a little bit. And uh, yeah, I, I for one love your videos. I, of course, I'm old enough to remember back when MTV came out and played music videos. You know, right. that's <laughs> what MTV stood for. <laughs> of course, it's been a long time since that, since those days. But your videos kind of harken back to those days where. It was just kind of fun. Uh, that's, sure. I, I look at, I just laugh. I look at your videos, and it makes me feel good. It's like this is really fun. <laughs> that's good. They're meant, they're meant to be fun. <laughs> Any plans? Uh, well, you're a prolific songwriter. You must be working on something new, right? Yeah. You got another CD uh, in the, I've in the always here? got. I've always got a dozen songs sort of in the studio, uh, and uh, yeah, we're hoping to get into back into the studio next this March, in about a month or so. And, start work on the next record. I'm a big believer in what Andy Warhol said. If, while people are busy talking about what you created, just go make more of it. I and, love it. Uh, yeah. I love that. It's for That's great. Me. And you got, I know you got a big gig coming up this summer too, <laughs> on the uh, USS Hornet over in Alameda. Yes, yeah. I, Fourth of July. Fourth yeah. of July. Mark your calendars, everybody. Lived in Alameda for about 18 months and uh, Hooked up with the, the guy who books gigs there, and hopefully this will uh, put the art back. You know, you can't spell military without art. So. Uh, um, yeah, and, and my my mom's dad, who was one of the gentlest, uh, almost most pacifistic souls in the universe, was a naval officer. So this will be honoring him. Uh, it's it's fantastic. fantastic. Yeah. Well, great. Matt, thank you so much for taking a few minutes with yeah. us here today. Oh, so you. good to get to know you a little bit more. And yeah. can't wait to, to hear what's next. Thanks so much. For all right. We'll catch you all later. Thanks so much for tuning in.